All right, whatever you do, don't call that number. <laughs> this morning we start a new study, Multiplying Your Life, and this morning we're going to talk about multiplying our lives through service. If you need a Bible, one of these gentlemen would love to put one in your hands. Just slip up your hand and uh, they'll make sure that you receive one. As we go through this study, it's about multiplying our lives. We know that we have one life to live. We understand that our life is to be salt and light in the world in which we live. And we know and we understand that there are ways to become very effective for Christ. And that is what we seek to do. We seek to utilize the one life that God has given us in such a way as to be truly effective. And this morning we're going to focus on what Peter says about service, serving the Lord Jesus Christ here. So if you take your Bibles with me and go to 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to pick this up here in verse 8, where we read, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint, as each one of you has received a special gift, employ it in the serving of one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do as one who is speaking the utterances of God, and whoever serves is to do as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Let's pray, shall we? God, we give you thanks for the word of God is clear. You alone are to be praised. You alone are to be worshiped. May our study of this passage today spark our hearts to desire to serve you better. May we bring to you the glory that you deserve. May we humbly serve you in a way that pleases you, I pray. And I ask all of this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Well, when we think about service, we are oftentimes, in our minds, dealing with something that is less than desirable. You might not have come to the service today if you knew that the topic was going to be on service. You may say to yourself, I'm already busy. The last thing I want to be is convicted about serving. Uh, why would I want to be doing that? Uh, I really don't have the extra time. Well, it's amazing to me as you look at Scripture, but Scripture is always pointing out that we as individuals have been saved by the grace of God, and we're called to be servants of the Most High. God has directed that we would use our abilities, as we're going to see from this passage, to bring honor and glory to Him. But service is not only what we think about. We oftentimes, um, like the guy in the song, we think more about ourselves than we do serving Christ. I draw you back to Luke chapter 22. In Luke chapter 22, we find uh, a really weighty passage of Scripture. In Luke chapter 22, we have Jesus just pouring his heart out. It is in preparation of the crucifixion. He goes through the Lord's Supper, and he, and he, is, he is just pouring out his heart to the disciples. And he says, this cup which is poured out before you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, he says, the hand of the one who betrays me uh, is, is with mine uh, on the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is, is going... Um, as, as has been determined, but uh, woe to that man uh, by whom he is betrayed. I mean, this is a very emotional time for Jesus. Jesus looks at the horror of the cross. He looks at what's before him. One of his own disciples uh, is going to turn his back on him, as we know. This is a time which is leading up to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is praying and the, the blood droplets are coming down from his forehead. This is a time of tremendous, tremendous angst. And what are the disciples doing? In verse 24, we read, and there arose, in the midst of all the things I just mentioned, there arose a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest. So which one of us is going to be the greatest? 
you know, oh, I think it's me. You know, I mean, look at all the things that I've been able to do with Jesus. And oh, yeah, well, no, 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 no. It cannot be you. I'm the greatest, and I'm going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And, and here they are, and it must have been so painful for Jesus to listen to that dialogue. And in the midst of it, Jesus would, would, would share some of the most important teachings that, that are non-salvation uh, related. And when he talks about the greatest in his kingdom will actually be the least. You see, serving Christ is in itself a great privilege to the followers. We are blessed because we're able to use our life for his honor and his glory. Over in 1 Peter chapter 4, we begin reading there in verse 1 about who we are. When we stop and think about ourselves as, as stewards, and we think of ourselves as followers of Christ, um, there are three basic questions that you can apply to stewardship. And one is, who exactly are we as Christians? And we might also ask, you know, where are we? You know, what, what is going on in our world? And thirdly, we might say, why are we actually here? And Peter is going to address who we are as Christians. In verse 1, he says, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. I am a child of God. I am a citizen of heaven. I'm an alien in this world, and I am called to the same purposes of my master Jesus. That is, I'm to do God's will with my life as well. Where are we? Well, in verse 7, Peter writes, and he says, the end of all things is near. Peter recognized that he was living in a fallen world. He realized that, indeed, the time was winding down. And in all of the world's history, you look at the time frame of the church, and you realize that this is a, a, a period of time that we don't know when it is going to all of a sudden come to its close, but we live today in the church age. But in the midst of this evil age, we find ourselves uh, living and ministering among people with whom the judgment of God hangs overhead. And so we're called to some serious response. And then thirdly, why are we here? We're really called to be ambassadors of Christ. We read at that last verse there in our text that our goal is to bring glory to God. In fact, even the next passage of Scripture further down would talk about the Christian suffering and the purpose is to bring glory to God. Why are we here? Ultimately, I am here to bring glory to my God in whatever that may look, however that may look, in whatever ways God seeks to do that with me. And so you and I need the purpose in our hearts that we want to multiply our life through the exercises of the gifts of God, which he has bestowed upon us. Now, Paul, Peter begins by talking here in verse 8, and he talks about this aspect of love, and he talks about this mutual love that we as Christians are supposed to have for each other. He also talks about this mutual service that we're supposed to have for one another. Now, notice with me here in verse 8 that Peter begins this discussion by saying, above all, keep yourselves fervent in love. Above all, he's, he's basically drawn here the canopy over the top, and he's saying this needs to be part of our pinnacle as followers of Christ. We are to show the love that God has called us to show. And no doubt, Peter, in his time with Jesus, heard this from the lips of Jesus. If we go back to the Gospels, we know the case is true, that Jesus would teach over and over again that indeed... It is important for us to have love one for another. Peter says, keep this kind of love fervent. Literally, the translation, keeping fervent your love among yourselves. And this adjective requires then that love is constant and it's intense. It has to be that way. The word fervent literally means to fill up or to stretch out. It, to, to have a full amount of love for each other is something that the church should be known for. And Peter would say this, he would say, because love covers a multitude of sins. Now, I could just kind of gloss over that and say, well, okay, you know, have love for one another, love covers a multitude of sins. We, we, we just kind of like, you know, just kind of like spit that out, don't we? But what does it really mean? What does it really mean that love covers a multitude of sins? Last week when we were in 2 Thessalonians, we found that there were some who were marching to a different drummer 
And Paul goes on and he says, listen, he says, some of you are out of step. He said, you're marching to the orders of someone else. In fact, the army is marching forward and the picture there was of a military exercise where someone was marching in the wrong direction. They're just marching off in the wrong direction. And Paul would say, don't associate with that one. Instead, he says, shame them so that they'll come back and march with everybody else. How do you balance all of this out? I, I think of Jesus' teachings in Matthew chapter 18. And Jesus says, if some brother sins against you and you're dealing with that, you need to go see him. And you need to address the situation and if he still doesn't acknowledge it or won't repent of it. He says, you need to get someone else to come along with you and approach that person. And if that still doesn't work, he says, this needs to be part of the church's withdrawing that affirmation of their salvation. So it's a big deal. How do we balance all of these things out? Well, I would submit to you that it's difficult to stop and think about all of these things. Paul is not, or Peter is not saying here in chapter 4 that we should ignore sin. If that was the case, then Matthew 18 would never apply. What is important to note is that love is that umbrella over all things. If I truly love my child, I'll discipline them, it says in Hebrews, just as God disciplines and chastises a son he will do to you and I who are his children. And so we discipline our children not out of frustration, but rather out of compassion. I disassociate with the brother who walks outside of the will of God, refusing to acknowledge the teachings of God. I do that because I love them and I want them to come back to the center. In Matthew chapter 18, if I don't love my brother who sins against me, I blow that brother off and say, I could care less, I'm never gonna talk to you again. But if I love my brother as I'm commanded to do, I'm going to seek him out, I'm going to explain to him about this offense, and hopefully we can get resolution so that our fellowship will continue in the future. That's all if I love that one. Love needs to be present in the church because I believe that there are times when we cause offenses one to another without even realizing it. And I believe that that's what Peter is speaking about here when he says, have this fervent love because it covers a multitude of sins in the sense that I am not going to be offended every time someone does something I don't like within the body and the body of Christ would be then at peace with each other. There are times because we're still sinners. Even though we're changing our lives and we're seeing Christ at work in our hearts and lives, the nasty fact is that we still have a sin nature. We deal with that. And at times, we offend people. Over the years of being a pastor, 30 plus years, I've heard people say, that Pastor Kevin, he walked right past me in the hallway and never said hello, and I am offended. Can I just tell you something? It's never intentional. It's amazing. You can ask any pastor, when, on Sunday morning, you're like riveted on your message, and it's like nothing else. I, if my wife is there, and, and we're in the, the master bath, and she wants to talk about it, she knows now, don't talk to me. I, I'm not saying anything, I'm not humming, I'm not doing, I'm shaving and I'm thinking, okay? And I don't care what's for lunch, I don't care about anything except what I am doing. So if I'm talking to you before the service, the first service, I might be talking to you and you think that I'm hearing you? <laughs> you know, he, he seems normal and it's like, meow, meow, meow. Talk to me after it's all done, all right? <laughs> there are times when we cause offenses, and, and we have to understand that the overriding principle needs to be that I still love you. You know that I love you, and so don't be offended. Things happen in the body of Christ. We used to have a VBS up in Pennsylvania that was, it was huge, and the kids would actually memorize out of a verse booklet that we put together. 
And some of the kids could memorize every single verse in that verse pack. I mean, every single one. And the key was to be able to say them fast enough in 25 minutes. So if you had 65 verses to say, I mean, you were really spitting them out. And there was huge competition, and we gave a grand prize for the young person who said the most verses at the end of the week. And our daughter, Melissa, she would go, and she would start on that on Sunday afternoon. It was always the big deal, you know, what new verses. We tried to stay away from the Iwana verses, because those kids in Iwana knew them all, you know. And, and we, we would we'd try to come up with some kind of crazy verse, you know, from, from Hezekiah 4 or something. And, and, and we, we, you know, we put these verses in there, and these kids would jump on it in Sunday afternoon. And they were, like, intense. And so by the time they came Sunday night, they were, like, spitting these verses out. And Melissa got all the way done on Friday night, and I think it was Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, she said the the whole book and she was expecting to win the prize and I announced the winner and it wasn't her she never said a word and I remember Karen saying to me afterwards so really you know you got those numbers right you think they got them right after you said the verses to the verse here, they took the book that they had and they took it into the office and they gave it to the collector and the collector would go through and enter it all into the computer or however they kept record of it all and, and they would spit the winner out, you know? And, and so Melissa didn't win. Nothing was ever said. Till five months later, I was wrestling around in that office and up on the bookcase, that verse here had taken the verse book and put it on top of the shelf where no one saw Melissa's Friday night total. She'd actually won by about 40 verses. And so all the honor was gone, you know, I mean, I tried to make it up to her, you know, and all that kind of stuff, but it just really is never the same, is it? We cause offenses sometimes in the body of Christ inadvertently. It was not that person's intention, I'm sure, to stick it up there and so that it would never be found. It was an oversight, and, and sometimes we do those things in the body. But the church is supposed to be different. We're supposed to have this fervent love. I'm reminded of the story about two brothers back in the, uh, an old German town back in the 1920s, who started a shoe company in their mother's laundry room. The number of, of things that were going on, these two brothers were interesting uh, young lads, but they started a company called the Dassler Brothers Sports Shoe Company. And it was a tiny little town in Germany that I, if I try to pronounce it, I'm gonna butcher it, uh, Herzogenagrich, you know, there you go. Good Irish lad trying to speak German. Um, <laughs> Adolf was the one brother's name. He went by the name, uh, nickname of Adi, Adi Dassler. He was quiet, he was the craftsman, designed, made the shoes. His older brother, Rudolf, or Rudy, was the extroverted salesman. He was the guy who, who was kind of the face of things. Well, although these brothers joined the Nazi party in the 1930s, it didn't keep them from being able to convince Jesse Owens to wear their shoe in the Olympics. He wore their shoe, he won four gold medals, and uh, afterwards their stock started to rise and they became known pretty well. Unfortunately, during the time of the war, however, something happened between these two brothers. I know that their, what I read is that their two wives didn't get along at all and I don't really know exactly what happened, but they went into a deep, deep conflict. The hatred became so great that they blew the company up and decided to make two shoe companies. Each one started its own factory on the opposite sides of the river that flowed through the city. Adi decided to name his new company after himself, Adi, and his last name was Dassler, and so Adi does was born. Rudy decided he was gonna do the same thing, so he started Ruda, but it didn't sound that great, so he changed it to Puma. These two shoe companies went head to head and it quickly became responsible, those two shoe companies, for the vast majority of the people in the town and their employment. So everyone was either an employee of Adidas or Puma. And then the rift became to get larger and larger. Local businesses refused to serve some Adidas customers. 
Other, other shops and restaurants would only, shoot, uh, only feed Puma customers. The city became enmeshed in the feud and it got so deep and it got so bad that the, the city itself was known as the town of bent necks. Because the first thing you did when you met someone was to look down to see what kind of shoe they were wearing which would determine whether or not you would even speak to that individual. Pretty sad, isn't it? While these two were fighting among themselves and spending all of their time fighting, a rival company by the name of Nike was born. It wasn't until 2009 that the employees of those two companies decided to bury the hatchet by having a friendly soccer match. It was four years after those two brothers had died and they were able to put the thing to rest. However, the millions and millions of dollars in sales that they lost because they were fighting against themselves instead of out there in the marketplace can't even be known. When these two brothers were buried, they were buried in the exact same cemetery. Incidentally, they died within four years of each other, um, and they buried them on the opposite ends of the cemetery. Now that's deep hatred for each other, isn't it? And isn't it amazing how that deep hatred affected not only their relationship and their wives and their children, but even the townspeople. And it affected them so adversely that they lost huge market shares to Nike. Wow. When you look at this, you can see in contrast to how the world responds, how the church is supposed to be different. Above all, Peter says... Have this fervent love for one another. Notice the second aspect, besides just showing love for, through forgiving one another, he says that we need to be hospitable. He tells us there in that passage, be hospitable to one another without complaint. Over in Romans chapter 12, Paul writes about it and he talks about loving each other and having preference one toward another in the body of Christ. And he goes on and he even says there at the end, be hospitable to each other, practice hospitality. As we know, hospitality was important in the early church. It was the first 200 years of Christianity, there weren't church buildings. They got together in people's homes. The missionaries would actually go from a stopover place where someone would open their homes and then that would give them enough money to get to the next city and away they would go. And, and so they went on and on, sowing the seeds of the gospel. But it was also necessary for Christians to break bread together. We see that in Acts chapter two. In Acts chapter two, the early church gets together, they break bread together, they fellowship, and the Bible says every single day. And so the admonition from Scripture is that we would carry out hospitality and we would allow ourselves to be engaged regularly in encouraging each other. Now, I find it interesting when Peter writes this, you see that there, it says, practice this hospitality, he says, be hospitable without complaint, which tells me that in and of itself, there's a lot of people, we're all tempted to complain, oh, I got to be hospitable. Now, you and I have definite patterns in our life. And bringing someone new into our home often sends us out of our comfort zone, doesn't it? Pushes us away from what we're used to. And so we tend to not to want to be hospitable people. And it's fascinating in our own society here in America, uh, Americans used to be much more hospitable. Americans used to, and especially Christians. I remember as a child uh, growing up a, a, in the church, and I remember on Sunday nights, we used to get together, and there were about four families, and we just took turns once a month going to certain people's homes for fellowship. It was neat. But today, you rarely see fellowship being practiced among Christians in the form of hospitality. Peter is trying to tell us something. We love not only in word, but we also love in deed as well. We have to show forth our love. 
And this is a way that we can do that by opening up our homes and bringing, uh, bringing people into our homes. It's an effective way for, for sowing the seeds of the gospel. Have some of your neighbors over to be able to, to just break some bread together and get to know them a little bit so that you can share Christ with them. So Peter says, here's this love. Show this love to each other. Then he goes on, and the third thing he says after hospitality is show love through the exercise of your spiritual gifts. We pick this up here in verse 11, or verse uh, 10, rather. It says, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Each one of us, he's saying here, and this is a past completed action, that every single one of us as followers of Jesus Christ have received at least one spiritual gift. That is that God has given to us by his hand something that is to be exercised in the body of Christ. By exercising that spiritual gift, we are showing compassion for each other. To withhold it is not to be a good steward. Now, here's what I like about this as I look at that word gift. The word gift, charisma, is uh, very closely associated with the word charis, which is the Greek word for grace. This is a gift that God has given to us. We didn't deserve it. It's not something that we necessarily asked for. It is something that God has looked at his church and said, this is necessary in the body of Christ, and so I'm gifting certain ones with this particular gift while I'm gifting certain other ones with another spiritual gift. All is supposed to come together and be exercised in the body of Christ. It's grace. God is giving this. It's not something that we deserved or even looked for. And he says, you need to use this gift in this passage, he says, for one another. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards. As a good steward? What does the word steward even mean? A steward is one who manages someone else's stuff. Are you with me? Back over in Luke chapter 16, we have a, a time there in, in Luke 16 where the owner of all the stuff finds out his manager has been stealing money for him. So he hires his CPA and tells him, come on in here and bring that manager and we're going to go through the books. And the manager freaks out because indeed he's been stealing from the manager or from the owner. And so uh, we know that when it comes to being a steward, there are a lot of abuses that take place. That's true. But have you ever thought of yourself, if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, have you thought of yourself as a steward, a manager of the spiritual gift that God has given to you? Have you ever thought to yourself, how well am I managing that spiritual gift? And it isn't it amazing when you look back at passages like Luke 16, where the owner of the stuff had to entrust the manager with that responsibility. Usually it was administration of his money, of his properties, of his land. Think of Joseph in the Old Testament who is a great manager and he is given all of this responsibility. In order for that to happen, let me just say this, the owner has to trust the manager. And God trusted you enough to give you a spiritual gift. What are you doing with that spiritual, spiritual gift? I say, well, nothing. I got it right here in my pocket. Oh, really? Does the rest of the body of Christ know it's there? Are you using it? I, what are you doing with it? He breaks this down and he says, here are some spiritual areas where you can use your gifts. He goes and he talks about this stewardship of the manifold grace of God. He says, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. And then he says, the one who's serving. And so we have speaking and we have serving. If you've been given a spiritual gift in the area of speaking, you are to speak as if you're speaking the very words from God. Maybe you're gifted as a teacher. Maybe you teach adults, maybe you teach kids. It doesn't really matter. 
Maybe you're visiting with us and you're a pastor at another church. You're standing up in front of people. You are giving forth the utterances of God. Now that is a very sobering thing. Because I know that when I stand up here, you need to hear from God and not from Kevin. You need to hear the words that God has prepared for us to hear. I remember my homiletics class. There was about a dozen of us in this class and we had to preach three messages in order to get out of the class. They videotaped you, they criticized everything you did, all your mannerisms, your facial expressions, your dumb jokes, I mean, everything got reamed on. I remember this fellow, he came up, we we have three messages in, in the hour time, you had 20 minutes, you had to preach this message. And I remember this fellow walking up, I remember his message and one other message of all 36 of those messages. He walked up and he opened his Bible and he stopped. And he looked down, he looked up. And he closed up his Bible and he took a step back and he said, This is the Word of God. And I have been so busy, I have not spent the time to study it sufficiently to be able to speak it. And he walked off. And the professor, no doubt, gave him an F because that's what I would have done. But I want to tell you, out of all those 36 messages, that message spoke more to my heart than any of the others. That was was profound. And I just respect that young man so much for how he honored the word of God that day. I want to call up my seminary professor It was Jeff Tuttle. If you remember Jeff Tuttle, he was back here in May. He was the homiletics professor. I want to have him call up that fellow. Uh, I still remember his name and tell him, you get an A. (laughs) Because that's what you really deserved. Honoring the word of God is, is something that's paramount if you've been given the gift in speaking. The second area of giftedness in this passage is serving. And he makes that statement there. He says, uh, Uh, whoever speaks it, and then he says, whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. If anyone serves. The word serve there is the, in the original, the word diakonos is a a derivation of this um, in the noun form. We have here the verb as one who is serving. A very simple word. This is the one who, who's just going to go out and, and serve the Lord. And he doesn't really differentiate what capacity that actually may be. This person is one who is just simply serving God. And he serves God not so much in his own ability or in his own strength. He is serving God in the strength, the Bible says there, that God supplies. The word there, supplies, is a word, we actually get the word chorus from it. And in classical Greek, it's an interesting thing, but in classical Greek, uh, that word chorus was used, and, it, and it, it came to be used as supplying in abundance because when you, you, when you took that word, when the choral group would come, everything needed to be paid and all the provisions needed to be made before they would sing one single note. And the idea was that if you took care of that supplying, if you took care of that core aspect you've taken care of their needs ahead of time. It is God who gives us the strength to be able to serve him. Every single one of the gifts that we have is according to his measure and according to his good strength. There is not one of us who is doing this out of self and honoring God. Every single one of us serves God because of the grace that he has put into us. And so we are not praiseworthy. I do what I do because God's grace has been given to me to be able to say what I say. But what I say is the word of God, hopefully. And it is not by any strength or any measure of myself that I do what I do. Everything has to point back to God. 
You see? Everything has to point back to God. You say, well, you know, all I do, I work in the nursery, I change smelly diapers. You do it because God supplied you the strength. Well, I, I could probably do it with, you know, you really? Really? Have you ever met people that can't do anything? You see, God gives us the strength to do it. I mean it. And it's so important to understand that oftentimes the servant in the body of Christ doesn't get recognition. And if they get recognition, they need to take the recognition and divert it back to the source. The church today has has an enormous problem with pride. Christianity has become proud. I really think I could make a good living if after I retire I made moose hats. <laughs> I remember when we went to Syracuse, New York to start a church, I remember our mother church, we operated under the pastor and deacons of the mother church. And it came time to wean ourselves off of the mother church and we needed to select two deacons. And so we selected two men and everyone by and large was, was a fairly new Christian. We, we, we selected two men to serve and I remember this, this young fellow, he was a little bit older than me, I was probably 27 and he was maybe 30. He'd married into money had a wonderful job working for his wife's dad. Wore wonderful suits, I remember. Had a really cool house. And after we selected those two deacons, it was never the same for him at the church. Because he couldn't understand why he wasn't selected to be a deacon. On the outside, he had more ability than the other two fellows. He's probably smarter than one, and maybe better looking than both but he was a new Christian and his pride got the better of him and he never was the same. Pride is an enormous problem in the body of Christ. People don't wanna serve God if they don't get recognition. It's, it's, it's like our heads grow big and we have to be somehow acknowledged. This word that we get the word diakonos out of is Speaking of service and acknowledging that Christ is the supplier of the strength of that. If you teach a Bible study, you preach a message, work in the nursery, shovel snow, whatever you do around the house of God, understand that everything points back to God himself. He is the divine source of all of our strength. Notice with me as we wrap this up here at the very end of Peter's uh, discourse here, he goes on that he says, so that, he's giving us there. Whenever you see those words, so that, you wanna pay attention to that. Because what he's saying is that we do it serving by the strength which God supplies, so that, here's the reason why God supplies the strength. That in all things, everything, God may be glorified. That's what it's all about, isn't it? It's about glorifying God. It's about putting him, number one, glorifying God through Jesus Christ. It's because to him belongs the glory, the Bible says, and the dominion forever and ever. Oh, you disciples who are arguing over who's going to be greatest in the kingdom while the Savior's on the way to the cross, how could you? How could you argue for prominence in the body of Christ when you recognize that you cannot have prominence in the body of Christ? That all of the prominence and the preeminence is Jesus Christ alone. You and I are just servants of the Most High, called to do whatever he decided a long time ago to do with us, giving to us charisma, grace, that we might serve him and bring him glory. Can I challenge your hearts this morning? Do you know Christ as your savior? Have you placed your faith in him? Has he, has he gifted you the gift of salvation? 
It is a free gift, the Bible says. But again, even to those who are outside the body of Christ, pride is so much a barrier. Would you lay down that pride and simply come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I acknowledge there is no other way that I can have eternal life except through you and place your faith in him. And could I challenge you this morning, if you're here today and you're a follower of Christ, what are you doing? How are you managing the gift or gifts that God has given to you? Are you utilizing them because you love the brethren and you want to be a blessing to them? Or are you selfishly hiding them away? And if you are serving, do you serve as someone who desires to point to back to Jesus? Or are you quick to take glory for yourself? Let's pray. Would you stand with me, please? If you're here and you desire to pray with someone after the service, the care and concern folks will be up front. Maybe you want to know more about where you're going to spend eternity. Maybe you just like to come to the front and sit and pray and talk with the Lord. Maybe it's time to surrender your life to Christ and allow the gifts that he has given to you to be used for his glory. Father, we thank you for the patience that you have with your children. We thank you, Father, for the love that you've shown to us over and over again. May you convict our hearts today. Convict us, Father, for truly we need you. And if there's anyone here today who's yet to respond to your grace, Lord, may they today lay hold of eternal life that's made possible because of the finished work of our Savior on the cross. Father, if there are those here who today are are serving with wrong motives. Lord, may you work in all of our hearts today. May we throw aside our, our pride, Father. May you receive the glory from, from who you've created. And may you challenge us, Lord, to be great managers of the gifts that you've given to us. Bless, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.